It's Game Boy World, and this is a side story. Can anyone handle the power of color? Atari Lynx, the portable video arcade. Nintendo's Game Boy was the world's first major commercially distributed portable video game console. Yes, it was preceded by the Microvision and Epic's Game Pocket computer, but neither of those had the distribution, backing, or support that Game Boy did, not to mention they all lacked acceptably robust technology. Game Boy was the first to bring all those factors together at once, and it became a tiny colossus. But it shouldn't have been that way. Nintendo ended up dominating the portable games market in large part because the Game Boy was a cleverly designed piece of equipment, yes, but luck factored in there heavily as well. In another reality, where events played out a little differently, Nintendo would have been at a disadvantage, scrambling to catch up with someone else's lead. As with the NES, Game Boy dominated the American portable market in large part because it launched into a vacuum. That almost wasn't the case though. Had things gone as planned for the Atari Lynx, August 1989 might have looked very different for Nintendo. Now, Game Boy would have had the Nintendo name behind it, yes, and it would have had the full backing of Japan's game industry, no doubt. Ultimately, Nintendo still would have led the market, but Lynx could have been a spoiler, making Game Boy's victory much less of a slam dunk than it was. See, while the Game Boy made its grand entrance in 1989, Lynx theoretically could have debuted as early as 1986. That was when developer Epix began work on its own portable game system, the Handy Game, which would eventually come into the world a few months after Game Boy's debut as the Atari Lynx. Now think back to 1986. The NES was only just beginning to enter nationwide circulation across the United States and hadn't even come to Europe yet. Meanwhile, here was Epix producing a portable system with a backlit color LCD and a processor to rival or even eclipse the NES's. In that light, the handy feels almost like some sort of aberration in time, as though someone had sent a game system from the 90s into the past, like the plotline of Harry Turtle Dove's nerdiest novel ever. Despite having been initiated three years before Game Boy launched, it utterly eclipses Nintendo's machine in terms of technology and features. Of course, that was probably the reason for Handy's downfall and Lynx's eventual failure. It was a lot of machine. Given the needs of the portable market, it turned out to be simply too much machine. Handy was so advanced that it ultimately became too expensive for Epix to complete on their own. The system's prototype was completed in 1987, but Epix, a software company first and foremost, lacked the resources and connections to bring it to life. The system lurked in limbo for two years until Epix finally rolled it out at Winter CES 1989, where Atari took note of the machine and stepped in to bring it to market. Uh, Atari, of course, was a different company in 1989 than the Atari of old. After the game's crash and resulting industry shakeout in the early 80s, Warner Communication broke Atari into two entities, Atari Games, the arcade manufacturing entity, and Atari Corp, effectively a computer company run by former Commodore boss Jack Tramiel. Atari Games was essentially a game developer with a focus on arcades, similar to the original Atari, while Atari Corp was more of a hardware manufacturer. The Atari that snatched up Lynx was Atari Corp, who hoped to add Lynx to their portfolio of hardware. The company had found moderate success with its ST and XT computer lines, especially in Europe, and it also continued to peddle old Atari consoles. In fact, Atari Corp's 7800 console, designed in the early 80s but delayed by the game's crash of 1983, ended up hitting the market in 1986, where it became a competitor to the NES. A fairly direct competitor, in fact, given that the two systems were powered by very similar chips and, at their base level, offered very similar capabilities. Of course, the NES stopped the 7800 in the marketplace. In a way, the Lynx sort of paralleled the 7800. Both were designed to be powerful devices for their respective times, yet both suffered from numerous delays that ultimately put them behind the ball when Nintendo launched a better supported and better marketed device first. So let's consider the Lynx, which in seemingly every way that mattered, stomped Game Boy into a mud puddle. Its screen may have been lower in resolution than Game Boy's, 160 by 102 versus 160 by 144, but what it lacked in pixels it more than made up for with colors. While Game Boy could display four nauseating shades of gray in total, Lynx could render up to 16 colors at once from a palette of more than 4,000. In fact, it could render more than 16 colors at a time with some clever programming tricks. On top of that, Lynx's screen featured a backlight, something the Game Boy family wouldn't receive as a standard feature until 2003. Where the Game Boy ran on a Z80 processor at 4 MHz, Lynx featured a 16-bit CMOS running at twice that speed. It packed four times the RAM of the Game Boy, and its serial port could support up to 18 players at once. Lynx even featured a unique user interface innovation. The system was ambidextrous, able to be played upright or upside down, a considerate nod to left-handed players. So on paper, Lynx had practically everything going for it. So why then did it fare so badly against Game Boy and even Sega's late arrival, the Game Gear? The Lynx's shortcomings had more to do with the overall user experience and needs of portable gaming. As we've seen before on Game Boy World, battery life played a huge part here. 
The Lynx required two more batteries to run than Game Boy, and in normal play, those six batteries only lasted about one-third as long as the Game Boy's four batteries. Those costs added up quickly. The Lynx was also hilariously huge, having fallen victim to ill-considered focus testing. Atari came to the conclusion that kids saw larger systems as more powerful and redesigned Lynx accordingly, resulting in a hulking behemoth that barely qualified as portable. The system would be redesigned later in life, but in its early days, it toiled in the shackles of a massive plastic shell that mostly consisted of empty air and frustrated regrets. Perhaps most devastatingly of all, though, Lynx shipped with a crippling lack of software. Not surprisingly, most of Lynx's early releases came from Epix, who was responsible for the system's design and naturally ported tons of their PC classics to the system. Eventually, Lynx also saw a steady supply of arcade titles by Atari Games. Even though the system's manufacturer was Atari Corp, it turns out the common thread of heritage between the two Ataris made for a steady flow of games for Lynx. Lynx also saw a fair few third-party titles converted by Atari or Epix, similar to how third-party games made their way to Sega Master System. And similar to Master System vs. NES, Lynx conversions of games like Rygar, Ninja Gaiden, and Double Dragon were based on the arcade originals rather than the creative interpretations that appeared on Nintendo systems. Ultimately though, Lynx's library over the course of its five-year lifespan topped out at a grand total of six dozen entries. Game Boy saw that many releases in the first 12 months of its life alone, and that was before the system's output really picked up. The Lynx, though powerful, became caught in a sort of self-perpetuating loop. Lacking software, hardware sold slowly, which meant few publishers wanted to publish games for it, meaning there was little reason for consumers to buy the hardware, and so on. Lynx had the poor fortune to go up against Nintendo at the absolute height of the company's global reach. NES Mania was at its peak in 1989, and the Famicom continued to perform well in Japan. Also, American publishers and developers still hadn't committed fully to consoles and especially portables yet, preferring the more powerful capabilities of personal computers. Japanese developers were mostly caught in Nintendo's tractor beam, and while some eventually migrated to the PC Engine, there was no way they were going to team up with a foreign developer. All of these factors combined to hobble the Lynx. It had fewer games, poorer battery life, worse marketing, and inferior portability to the Game Boy. It also cost twice as much. These failings unfortunately eclipsed the system's strengths. Its beefy processor, an excellent backlit color screen, which was superior not only to Game Boy, but Game Gears as well. What Epix and Atari discovered too late was that the handheld market doesn't operate under the same rules as console gaming. Efficiency, portability, and convenience trump power and fidelity. Whether this was something Nintendo and Gompei Yokoi intuited based on prior experience or simply lucked into, the simple fact was that Game Boy proved a better match for the needs of the market than Lynx did. Still, Lynx was by no means a terrible system. It was power hungry, yes, and that, combined with its titanic size, made it lousy as a system to take on the go. But it had impressive power, and its library honestly offered a higher proportion of quality to crap than Game Boys did. While it wasn't the ideal machine for long car trips, Lynx was a pretty great self-contained game system. Among its highlights, some solid renditions of arcade titles like Stun Runner and Road Blasters, a clever puzzle game called Chip's Challenge, a crazy gauntlet sequel featuring Nerd as a character class, and, oddly enough, a faithful conversion of Ninja Gaiden 3 for NES. On top of that, Lynx enjoys a vibrant homebrew community, which has resulted in both some interesting original releases, as well as ports of popular arcade titles like Loadrunner and Raiden. All told, Lynx deserved better than it got during its short and rocky life. Unfortunately, the logistics of its distribution and the unstoppable might of NES-era Nintendo made for an insurmountable barrier that the machine was never able to overcome. I can't help but think that, had its timing worked out a little differently, Lynx could have been a force for Nintendo to reckon with. Game Boy would always have been less expensive and more energy efficient, but if gamers had already become accustomed to Lynx's high-impact visuals, that lousy green-gray screen would have been a much harder sell. But we'll be giving Lynx its due here on Game Boy World Gaiden. Working through the system's library is an aside to the main journey through Game Boy's history. It may have been eclipsed, but Lynx won't be forgotten. For more about the Atari Lynx, keep reading GameBoyWorld.com.